Okay. Uh, if you can give me one second, please. Yes, Leah? Yes. Okay. I have a, I have a meeting right now, but if, yeah, do you want to? No problem. I'm just going to, I'm just starting a Zoom conference, but um, if, uh, do you want me to call you back in it? Can you give me a quick, maybe a quick one and we might be able to get to it, but otherwise I'll call you back in an hour. Okay, sounds good, thanks. All right. Okay, I'm going to start here. Okay. All right, whenever you're ready, Dan. Okay. My name is Chris Serino. I'm a physician um, in internal medicine and infectious disease board certified. Um, and I have a specific interest in behavior. And so the idea of the concept of mindfulness um, comes up quite frequently in how we can start addressing our behaviors and work towards change. Now, the first half of the talk that we gave last week um, was an update on how our nervous system uh, taps into the senses that are around us and our brain process, processes those in the moment that we're experiencing the sense and oftentimes um, represents a narrative and sometimes can be not actually the reality. And so in understanding that concept, the, the hopes are that we could step outside of our narrative, which uh, could be this little voice in our head that tells us one thing or another that may not be actually true. And so we'll talk a little bit about uh, step two, which basically, or part two, it takes one step outside the loop to get started. And so we'll talk about what that means. Okay. So uh, behaviors, as I recall, uh, re reviewed with you last week, in many ways, um, our nervous system, as it was developing and pruning excess neurons, um, and we were developing into a mature brain um, when we were born, much of the original signals that we sensed were personal needs. We needed to have food, we needed to be warm. And in many ways, our behavior started around those early constructs, um, those early senses. And, and, and so in, in many ways, behavior itself is an instinct, it is a reflex. Um, you know, one of the hundreds of reflexes that a baby has is a crying reflex. Um, and certainly it serves a purpose um, to, to express that the baby has a need. And so in, in many ways, our behaviors developed even early on before we actually understood words. Um, so, um, and, and I wanted to review this one concept again about the fact that we head towards things that are positive to us or that provide us pleasure or reward. And we tend to sway away from things that um, cause us pain. Now, that is, these are simple, um, reflexes, simple conditioning measures that, that, we, that our brain protects us uh, with. Now, sometimes negative behaviors can be perceived as having out, um, positive outcomes or effects and vice versa, triggering repetition or avoidance uh, behaviors. Um, I also would say, in, 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 and this is sort of the concept of resilience and developing or grit, is that sometimes a pain or discomfort can be a transitional zone as we improve ourselves. Um, I re I'm reminded frequently when the children uh, tell me, Dad, I'm feeling bored. Um, and you know, we think of what boredom is to us. It's a feeling of just kind of a gnawing feeling of, of having to move around, wanting to do something. In a way, that's a craving call to doing something um, simpler and, and sometimes it's through that boredom that there, that there's a room, there's sort of a, a void where creativity can fill. So behavior is regulated by neurotransmitters. A change of the behavior is possible. And as the behavior changes, the brain changes. And that's, that's a wonderful concept of neuroplasticity 
um, just as I gave you those examples about the taxi cab driver study, um, uh, this, this applies to anything that we do in our life, not just driving a taxi or playing a musical instrument. It's about the way we process what is around us. Um, I will review uh, some of the basic concepts of these neurotransmitters. To suffice it to say that these are chemical signals between nerves and um, essentially these chemical signals can be not only reflexively um, um, provided in a sense by our brain, but they can also be actually, you know, kind of guided by our thought process. So in, in a way, um, our prefrontal cortex can generate various, um, various signals. So it's the, the, in, in that way, we've got things, we have glutamate, which excites receiving neurons, and GABA, which inhibits receiving neurons, serotonin, which our brain is very uh, sensitive to, um, is actually mostly made outside of our brain, um, specifically in our gut. 90% um, of serotonin is, 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 um, is um, made in, uh, outside of the brain. And that gives us this sensation of pleasure, um, in some cases, uh, any sort of this physical attribute to an emotional state. And um, we know that because when you have excesses of neurotransmitters like serotonin, we see physical changes in our body. We have a fast heart rate, we get flushing, we get uh, you know, diarrhea, we get these physical changes that occur. So we know that um, serotonin has more of a uh, sort of the physical side of, of an enjoyment. And you can imagine any time that you experience uh, an emotion such as pain or pleasure, why it could also be experienced not only in the brain level, but sort of our entire body. And you may remember situations where you felt pain in your finger or something, and all of a sudden that's the only thing that you're thinking about. Um, with dopamine, as I was saying, it's sort of like on the fence type of a, a neurotransmitter that's a calling. And in fact, um, it's, you know, it's excesses or changes can, can lead to that signaling. And so sometimes if, Let's say someone, uh, I'll give you an extreme example, someone who uses drugs is now recovered for the last two months. When, they, when a person walks by and sees a situation um, where they, they remind themselves of drug use, the dopamine will then send out a, a spike and that spike is sort of a call to, uh, to the action. And so in ways we are, we are, we are not only, if you think about being in the water, you know, where the waves are hitting at us, not only are we, you know, responding to that, but we can actually, uh, not only do we sense that, but we can respond to that. We can create our own actions. And so too, the, the fact that we can signal our own neurotransmitters through, through what is in our thoughts and that can change our brain. So it's kind of a very fascinating concept. Um, I, I want to mention about emotions because we're going to be talking a little bit about COVID-19 um, at this talk. So think of the brain as a sensor and effector. So it's not only sensing, but it's actually changing or active, active, acting on it. Um, we think of our emotions, um, you know, there's movies that sometimes depict, you know, there's this specific emotional state, you know, as a creature, it might be a cartoon or something. But our emotions are really not in just one place. There isn't a, a, a signature in that way of what an emotional experience is. It's not like part of our back of our brain or the front of the brain. No, it's it's actually multiple places that tr that help to create an emotion. It comes from memory. It comes from you know a physical response. Um, and so uh, sometimes um, um, the newer techniques such as functional MRI. Uh, which is essentially a way to assess activity in the brain during a state. So you can tell someone, you know, I want you to think of a happy thought. What does the brain do at that time? And these are, this is, this comes from a, a, an article here in 2016. They, these are the images that they showed, but um, you can see in many ways, these uh, states um, require many of the same parts of the brain but in and of itself that they're slightly different with the voxel measurements, which are you know, the, the image 
uh, coalescence of, of, of colors here, um, you can almost find a signature to, to, uh, to an emotion. So um, think of it this way, is you know, when someone recalls an emotion, they may recall a memory uh, uh, of, of the past when they've experienced that emotion before, uh, such as a pain or a pleasure. They may recall um, a twist in it where, uh, although it was painful, they, they feel a pleasure to it. Um, there may be a physical response. And so all of these things are getting called up in the brain. Um, you know, so it is a very multi, uh, a fo uh, there are multiple foci. But here's our fear. And this is depicted by the fear here. And, uh, and in COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we've got you know, some reason to, to you know, really feel or palpate the fear. Um, part of it is, is that this is a new process to our brain. And so we have to construct our future and, 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 and it starts in the brain, but that future construct is basically is a change of what our normal routine is on our brain because that's the brain is really meant to to be to be um, efficient you know to be able to conduct behaviors uh, similarly so when all of a sudden you've got a a, a mind shift literally where we have uh, we're in the in the midst of an epidemic a pandemic um, things are getting canceled our routines are changing there's there, there's sort of a substrate there where fear can grow. And uh, so there's that uncertainty, you know, who to trust, what kind of information to trust, how much to trust, um, and piecing through some of the information and misinformation, which is, which is amazingly abundant on, online. And um, one of the things that comes with this uncertainty is the fact that it is a moving target in our discovery of this virus. We're finding more information about the way it causes disease, who's at risk. Uh, what about the fact that, oh yeah, you know, we, we're, if we're older, we have a greater risk of, of it, but it's not completely, you know, you, you're 70 or older, for instance, and you know, you're, you're at super high risk. No, there are some old, uh, modifiable ver uh, risk factors. We also know on the other hand, that you can be 40 years old and, and have severe disease. So we, there are certain things we don't know about our immune system yet that can increase a person's risk for severe disease. The virus can be lethal. The virus is spreading. The virus cannot be seen. So all of these things are triggering our constructs. You know, We're developing a hypothetical situation about, oh, what if I get involved in this? Or how is this gonna affect my finances? These are things that we don't know completely that our brain is thinking it over for us. And so sometimes it can skew our, our experience and interpretation of our personal risk and we'll go through bias together. And then fear can focus our thoughts on these hypothetical situations and actually alert our fight and flight response, which I shared with you last week that is um, very useful but on the long term, it not only doesn't make it doesn't make sense to have a fight or flight response um, every day, but it's also uh, um, um, not uh, helpful for our, our our living a state of wellness. It affects our immune system, it affects our vascular system, and it affects um, the way our brain um, changes because of the neurotransmitters that we talked about and neuroplasticity. Uh, this is a brief story. Um, since we have a little extra time, I was going to share this. Um, it it's suffices to say that uh, this is a common story a lot of you might have heard, but uh, an old farmer is working outside in the road. Um, he takes a break and there's someone who's wandering uh, nearby and says hello. Um, he, and he asks the question, what sort of people live in the next town? The stranger is asking the farmer. Well, the farmer asks, what were the people like where you came from? Um, and so we're sort of answering the question with another question. Uh, the stranger said, they were a bad lot, troublemakers all and lazy too. The most selfish people in the world and not one of them uh, should be trusted. I'm happy to be leaving those scoundrels. And then the farmer says, is that so? Well, I'm afraid that you'll find the same sort in the next town. And then a little later, another stranger comes in the same direction, hailed the farmer and they stopped to talk. What sort of people live in the next town, he asks. What were the people like where you came from? 
and um, the, the stranger answers, they were the best people in the world, hardworking, honest, and friendly. I'm sorry to be leaving them. He said, fear not, the farmer. You'll find the same sort in the next town. And so it's sort of this idea that we construct our, our future self through our attitude, and that attitude affects our behavior. And so how can it be that you know, two people are seeing the, you know, from the same world and the same input, sometimes we see totally different things. And so we'll go through that. Um, I mentioned this in the last talk and it's about, let's think of our little box here as our body and our brain, sort of the, the super processor of our body with our senses out and we have a sense of touch. And I think, you know, we know when we think about touch, we think about, you know, our fingers reaching out and touching something, feeling the texture, but we have a lot more than the sense of touch than just our fingers. You know, we've, we can feel pressure, we can feel vibration, we can feel heat, we can feel um, what it feels like to have someone just a few inches above our, our skin, you know, that, so it's, uh, we imagine those things in some ways, our, our sensation is reaching what um, our brain is reaching that sensation. We take the inputs in and we process it and we spit it out and this becomes our reality. So, um, so I wanna talk to you about cognitive bias and that's sort of this idea that our reality can be skewed just like those um, illusions that I showed you, those, those uh, two dimensional illusions that look like they're moving around. Our brain can also be skewed. And it's the idea that the brain attempts to simplify information to more of a rule of thumb type of a view. Some are related to a, a particular memory that potentially is, um, as you see, you know, when a reality occurs here in front of our eyes, we all have a different experience of that reality based on what our attention is to it, based on how we interpret things. And so that can also fuel future bias when we address things. Um, uh, looking back at that memory. Some might be related to our active attention. There's processing errors that occur as we re retain things. Um, and it, it calls into question this idea of, you know, how much can a, a, a star witness be able to, you know, spew out the, the, the actual events that occurred. And, and that becomes very hard. I, you know, the best thing in, in many ways to capture the memory is to immediately get it right before all it gets involved in our memory system. So, you know, so there are different things that, that lawyers, for instance, can do to try to um, get the best story. Examples, assuming everyone shares your opinion, you know, you're in a room and you just started talking about something and maybe, maybe um, you know, this is an example, I, I hear people sharing things about you know, their prejudices for people, you know, racial prejudice. I, I, I hear this sometimes with patients um, and I'm like, okay, I don't necessarily see it that way. Um, learning a little about a topic and then assuming that you know all that, that, that there is to know about that topic. And we see that a lot with uh, some of the posters in the Facebook, people posting, you know, from an article they read um, and making a sweeping statement of something. Uh, this is probably something we all have um, as a bias, um, including myself. It's uh, believe that that you might know something more than you really do. I mean, it's, you know, it's, we always have to keep ourselves in check to that. Um, and I think the important part here is to be sensitive to the fact that your world is skewed from what reality is. Here are a couple other types of bias. Uh, one is a halo effect. And uh, that's this idea that, you know, you get infatuated with someone and all of a sudden, um, or a particular thing you like about their character and all of a sudden it affects their overall view of that person and their character. There's this availability or heuristic, which means, you know, the first thing that comes to your mind, you put a greater, greater value than a second thing or a third thing that comes to your mind that might actually be closer to what the right answer is. So, and I do that a lot in example, uh, sometimes with, uh, you know, multiple choice questions. Self-serving bias. It's this external forces when bad things happen are, are causing you to fail because of external forces or you give yourself credits when good things happen. There's this attentional bias where we pay attention to things while ignoring other things and that shifts 
our, our view of things. So it's like if you buy a car and you really like the leather seat, but you don't realize that, you know, it has the worst gas mileage, uh, it still might be in favor to you and you may purchase it, not, not looking at the full picture. Um, actor observer bias. Um, one act, you know, this is an interesting thing where, you know, let's say you have a problem, you have a high cholesterol, you blame it on, you know, your genetics. Whereas if other people have high cholesterol and you blame it to them that, oh, they're just not exercising well and taking care of themselves. So these, and that can go on in other examples. There's this idea of functional fixedness where, you know, you look at something, let's say, you know, I have, uh, you know, I can give an example, but let's say I have a key, you know, everyone knows a key opens, this is a, a valet key, but everyone knows a key opens a door, but that tool, that could be used as a tool for something else. And it's sort of like thinking of someone who's a personal assistant and not realizing that that person can be a leader as well. You know, so it's a bias that, that we have. Anchoring bias. You, we, we rely too heavily on the first piece of information. Optimism bias. Uh, sort of this idea that, oh, that's not going to happen to me. I'll be fine. And we, we, look, we feel like we're less likely to suffer from a misfortune. Um, but on the other hand, we have the negativity bias, which a lot of us uh, can sometimes feel like our, our mind's taking us to when, let's say, for instance, you're late for a meeting and the first thought you come to mind is, oh, I'm always late, or, um, or if you make a mistake. 99.9% .9 of the times you do fine, but then you make this mistake and all of a sudden that's what you do. So that's sort of that negativity bias. And I think that also fuels in some of the fears that uh, we may be having of COVID-19. So here, take a, take a bouquet of flowers here. Mother's Day is coming up uh, Sunday. And I, I just got my mother some flowers. Um, and uh, so you can take a look at this flower. Um, I'm gonna give you some alternative realities. So you've got some points of view. Oh, another bouquet of flowers. Or, you know, that transparent vase is ugly. You know, it's just not the right color for the, for the vase. You know, the flower arrangement is not done by a professional. I just don't think so. You know, I hate flowers. I just hate what, I hate people just getting flowers for me. And when you get flowers, that means that you don't have enough creativity to get me something else. So these are interpretations, um, kind of alternative realities. And then uh, we have the other side of things. And, and, and these aren't not necessarily polarized, but oh, another bouquet of flowers, you know, just being really happy about that. The transparent base has a nice color and lets me know when the water is low, you know, someone thinking more functionally. Uh, this was a beautiful arrangement, you know, or I love flowers instead of I hate flowers. Or when you get me flowers, that means you love me. So, you know, these are not necessarily true either, uh, but they're just interpretations um, and then the, this, this may be closer to mindfulness is those are flowers. And I have a feeling in my, I have a feeling that I'm being cared for. So just basic ideas that those are flowers. So um, what is mindfulness? So this is a, a sig symbol. I don't know how it's pronounced, but it's basically the sim uh, Chinese character uh, for the word mindfulness or mind. It is the same character also for the word heart. It's the same word. So it's an, I think that's an interesting example um, that, you know, sometimes, you know, if we look at it in, in a Western eyes, we, we separate the two, but, you know, in, in other cultures, in, in, in Chinese characters, uh, mind and heart is the same. So maybe look at this as heartfulness as well. So mindfulness is that constant focusing and refocusing moment by moment on the object of our awareness. So in that case of the bouquet of flowers, you know, we're refocusing, we're trying to be in the moment, we're trying to understand our sensation, um, focusing our awareness on the now while calmly acknowledging and accepting our feelings, thoughts, and bodily sensations. And it's that process of bringing one's attention to the internal and external experiences and then we'll talk about some ways that we can work on developing that. So it's this idea of awareness, acceptance, present moment, mindfulness. Um, it brings me to the attention about the heart and mind thing. I wanna show you something that's very neat. 
here. This, this is a normal EEG, okay? Um, although it probably seems very understanding and very, very clear, our brain is constantly sending signals in a sense to think of it as like a wavering of one side and another. It's sort of like in a sense of balance, in a, in a sense of balance, we're seeing you know, signals in one direction and signals in another direction. Um, and I think of that, so this is an example of epilepsy where you actually have organized, there's some organized signals and that actually isn't normal. So I just want you to think that in a way our body is this dynamic state that is kind of checking you know, directions and it's keeping itself in balance. It's, you know, when we think of ourselves standing up, we have both oppositional muscles that are allowing us to do that. And we're constantly checking that with our nervous system. Here's another example. Uh, this is a normal rhythm, but you can see here that there's a separation. You can see these little rhythmic, this is the electricity of our heart. And you can see, you'd like to see it in a nice pattern. One, two, three, four, but here it changes. And what happened is a normal signal of our heart in response to breathing. So when we breathe out, our heart rate slows. When we breathe in, our heart rate speeds. And so these are signals, we call this sinus arrhythmia. And so that's a normal thing. Now I, I'm, I'm using this as an example, but there's a truth to it. And it's the fact that we, we are in a dynamic, we are a dynamic, beings and so too with mindfulness you know checking and constantly uh, checking the, the feelings that we're experiencing and realizing that the feelings in some cases could be triggered by reflex um, that may not be actually what's going on and so it's sort of like seeing yourself in the forest and outside of the forest at the same time so what are some examples of mindfulness and mindlessness so the opposite of mindfulness, I suppose, is mind, mindlessness. Um, but interestingly, uh, there, it's a paradox. In, in some cases, in being in a mindful state is almost like your mind isn't um, completely focusing on the past or the, or the future. It's focusing on the present. So in a way, it could be the paradox of mindfulness is, is not really having to, uh, to worry about things. So kind of being mindless. So uh, an example of mindlessness is getting offended when someone disagrees with you. And the opposite of that, I, I suppose, would be listening to understand their difference and understand and clarify. Getting angry when someone cuts you off in the road or speaks over you is another example of getting um, feeling mindless versus calmly reflecting on what is happening, listening to what the underlying source of the concerns are and asking him or her clear clarifying questions. Another example would be your child doesn't want to go to bed. So you get frustrated and you get the belt out. And, you know, parents have all been through that situation. I, I certainly have. And I've, I caught myself and I thought to myself, you know, this isn't getting the message across that I love my child, but that I, I'm frustrated. Um, what it's getting a message is that you know, that the child is not able to be ready to go to bed. They're, they have issues that are unaddressed. And here I am throwing a belt at, into it, which it really is a mixed signal to a child. So this idea of clearly stating the expectation, set, creating a boundary and setting up quiet time and being cognizant that, you know, just, you know, like an adult can sometimes do, you don't just click your fingers and you're, you go to bed. You need a little time to prepare. So these are some of the key words, angry, peaceful, calm, still going from mindlessness to mindfulness, frustrated, tolerant, offended, hurt, seeking to understand, stressed, relaxed, begrudging, forgiving, aversive or passive to directive and assertive, right? We don't, you know, to the opposite of not being, a, 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 um, the opposite of not fighting and is, is not just ignoring a problem if there's a problem, right? You wanna be assertive to making sure that you that people understand who you are and what you stand for. There's this idea of passivity that um, some people get into this cycle where they want to avoid confrontation, but essentially what they're doing is they're eclipsing themselves in their passivity. So it's about being directive and assertive. Draining and destructive versus restoring and creative. 
you know, and I, I think of it in many ways. Um, if you think about a bully and a bully, that kind of classic uh, paradigm of a bully and a, a, a bullying person versus a bully person, in many ways, they're, they're, you know, the opposite sides of the same coin. And so there's needs that are not getting met. And I like to look at it also as, you know, if you think about the fact that we have these constructs in our brain that shape who we are as we are right now, we have multiple thought processes um, that th those behaviors, given that they've rooted in, in much in our, our infancy, in a way, when someone cries out, you know, or stresses out or feels angry, yells at a person, criticizes a person, any of those things that I guess we all kind of, you know, we, we all kind of settle in sometimes, it's sort of like their, their, their baby crying that they have a need. Um, and, um, and, and, and I think once you start seeing things in that manner, you can address the need rather than, you know, externalize the, the reason why that need isn't being met. And so, you know, we, we see it all the time, right? When people criticize other people, call people names, um, even people that are, are in very high positions of power, um, blaming people. Um, so I think it's just that idea of, understanding that there's a need that's not being met. And it's usually a question of value, uh, you know, whether a person is being valued or it's a question of, um, um, of, of being included and, and those things that the person doesn't feel like their needs are being met. So fortunately, um, we don't have to live a life of reflexive uh, emotional state. Um, we know, I, I told you about in the last talk that those emotions can make, uh, have an amazing effect on our body, not only in our, a way that we view our life, but actually on our health. Um, you know, certainly uh, we know emotions can affect our sleep, emotions can affect uh, various uh, neurotransmitters in our body, which also shape our brain to experience those emotions more readily, that if it fires, it wires. But those neurotransmitters, other such as cortisol and norepinephrine, can actually affect our body's ability to heal, our body's ability to fight an, uh, an infection, our, our body is able to, re to resist cancer. Um, I say these in, in, in sort of a generic term, but there, there is a, a growing body of research showing um, you know, the law of very significant trauma in someone's life can lead to an increased risk of, uh, uh, or it, if you're looking at people who've had a risk of cancer, looking back, had, had they had a significant trauma or loss or loved one, yes, those, those things come up. And I mentioned to you about the last talk about the ACEs scores, which are those um, early childhood um, um, trauma uh, experiences, and that that can lead to not only, uh, you know, uh, conditions that affect a person, let's say multiple sexual partners, multiple um, sexually transmitted infections, financial problems, career problems, but also health problems too. So all of these things, our body and our mind are completely interwoven. Um, and so we have to think if we wanna take care of our body, we need to take care of our mind, right? Mensana incorpora sana, a sound mind and a sound body. So we lower our stress by being mindful um, we decrease those, those, horm neuro those hormones that are being released and it improves our brain's ability. When we're under a constant state of conflict or stress, our brain is only capable of thinking in the immediate needs. And so that's that fight or flight response. We can't completely, uh, completely reason past that response. So that's why things, and that's when those cognitive distortions get really in there. You're like, you're telling me this, this is what you're doing, you know, and, and you're basically kind of showing, you're sort of spitting out your narrative. And that's when those cognitive distortions can really be, uh, really affect us anytime we're under a stress state. Restore emotional balance. Mindfulness can help to improve our recovery from emotional system situations, sort of like that idea of resilience. Um, we all can experience a trauma, you know, um, we can all experience this trauma of, uh, in a sense of being separated by people, um, being in a quarantine. And some studies have sh suggested that a quarantine experience in a way is like a, a, a trauma enough that people can experience post-traumatic stress disorder afterward. But 
it, you know, the person who has that mindful awareness that they're developing that, they, they're sensing when they could potentially be at greater risk and then they do the self-care that's needed. So it's sort of this constant check and balance um, that, you know, so we can all experience a hardship like a death of a loved one, but it's that check and balance that, um, that the resilient mind offers to protect our mind for the future and our body for the future. Um, this idea of reducing anxiety, um, um, mindfulness has been shown to decrease anxiety in adolescence. That's a time where mindfulness is important because there's a lot of cognitive distortion going on um, and it improves concentration. And that's that idea, again, if you're focused, if your brain is constantly receiving a barrage of these neurotransmitters that are trying to keep it safe, either by fighting or, or fleeing, um, we can't really, it's just, just a great distracting distraction of, of what we need to get a task done. So I'm going to offer some strategies to mindfulness. Do we have any questions at this time? All right. Well, this is the fun part. Um, so, so if our brain is completely linked with our body, our body can be the pathway to mindfulness. Um, it doesn't have to be this kind of mystic meditation or retreat or, you know, being in a, a you know, in, in a, a hermit, for instance, to be mindful. Um, if you think about it, we can be mindful um, during the day in a package, you know, where we just take care of ourselves. We do, we take ourselves for a jog, you know, once a day we, we exercise. But we also have to be aware that mindfulness needs to be going on at all times. So this idea of mindfulness minutes or milliseconds or instances. Um, so if you think about our body, these are, I'm, I'm gonna talk with, about the fact that our senses totally link to our brain, we can achieve some mindfulness through interacting with our body. Um, so touch such as massage, healing touch, shiatsu, uh, various smells um, can help to restore a state, particularly because smell has a memory, and um, and that's a that's an application of a of, of of a memory that's personal. So let's say if I, you know, gave you a pine tree smell, and um, and that pine tree smell reminds you of when you were involved uh, when the house got on fire because the Christmas tree was on fire. That pine tree smell may not give you a relaxing. Uh, um, you know, uh, may not give you relaxation to smell it. So it's a very personal experience. Um, visual, visual kinesthetic, and that's moving your body and, you know, doing, doing things that are using your, your vision, your movement, and, and much of these overlap. Remember, we talked about the brain, the fact that, you know, when we do a task, like let's say we play an instrument, you know, we're using our, our, our vision, we're using our hearing, we're using our movement and our memory. All of these things are just kicking in. Um, and then there's movement and positional like Tai Chi, yoga, exercise, walking and jogging. Now these, all of these, these are not uh, meant to be, you know, black and white things because many of these things overlap with each other. There's the CNS sympathetic and parasympathetic um, approach, which would be, and, and again, these types of things on the top on number one will affect the sympathetic and parasympathetic. We have meditation, we have good sleep, um, which is very important for keeping one calm. We have relaxation techniques such as breathing or music, mindfulness instances. Uh, so one way of, of getting mindful, you're hearing the storm around you and, and it's the idea of being able to focus and, um, you know, sort of center yourself as there's a storm around us. And that's that storm of reality. You know, I've got three kids in the house. They're yelling, if they're yelling at each other or they're playing games, I hear them running around. It's that idea of being at the calm in that storm of sensation. Um, in one example, this was a study here. Um, oh. I don't know what date it was. I believe it was in early 2000. Massage therapy and depression. Um, this was a meta-analysis of 17 randomized control uh, trials that showed a positive effect on depression by getting massage. And so touch, you know, touching, even self-touch, you know, if you want to give yourself a self-massage, um, probably 
um, is a step in the right direction. It lowers your cortisol levels. It is a relaxation state. And by doing so, it also decreases the risk of depression. So it's your, it's your, it's one of those things you turn your mind on. If you feel you're getting in that direction, then you, then you help, you help yourself get out of it. Um, I talk about art and I'm in the process of writing uh, a book about art, the brain and the pandemic. Um, it's quite a, um, a task because it's not completely in my, uh, in, in the realm of my, um, normal comfort zone in infectious diseases, but it, it's also quite a wonderful learning experience. But the idea is, is we're gonna, you know, well, how does the brain get affected by these kind of fear factors? And um, how does art potentially serve as both an outlet to the, um, to the artist, but also the observer? So um, when you're doing art, multiple skills are, are, being in, um, in, are being used or are being applied sensory, motor, prefrontal, and hippocampus as far as positional and memory. And, um, and so there, there's a multiple kind of activation of our brain. And we know when we activate our brain, our brain is stimulated and our brain is stimulated to grow. So um, that's what I was saying about if you were activating your brain to be sad, your brain grows to the direction of being sad more easily. But so too with any of these skills, when you activate your brain, the brain, you know, triggers and it, it grows, and um, and so um, it can. This the retention of art, the skills of, of art, can be fairly resilient. Uh, uh, some studies looking at people after stroke um, are still capable of of drawing. Similarly, um, if there are certain centers that are affected um, where there, for instance, um, neglect, because some, sometimes our, part, of our, we, uh, part of our brain, the parietal uh, area, and I don't know, I forget the specific center in the parietal uh, area of our brain. When, that, uh, when we get a stroke in that area, we develop what's called hemineglect, where we don't even realize we have our other side of our body. And so, I, and it's again, not on our face, but on our, uh, well, it can be on our face, but it's on the opposite side of our, our body where, where the stroke is. And so in some cases you'll see people just, they're, they're just um, coloring their one, one side of their body with nail polish, for instance. Um, that includes when they draw, they may draw an image of one side. They may not be capturing the other side if they're copying and drawing. And so that idea of hemming neglect. But other than that, for the most part, stroke, um, through stroke, um, art can still be a fairly resilient and retained skill. Um, and some people even have stories of becoming artists after a stroke, um, so newly developed. So we know that the brain can, can develop new neur you know, neural circuitry um, even after an injury like a stroke. Uh, similar neural pathways are used in communication. So in written and um, spoken communication, we're using the similar neural pathways. And, and of course, you can, you can see that with writing. In some, um, in some um, countries, the writing is a symbol. Um, and, and you can say, well, our letters are a symbol too, absolutely. Um, and art can be also that symbol um, that can speak to people often even more poignantly than the words themselves. And I give an example here that smokers, if they saw a negative message in an image, like in the box, a uh, cigarette box, they're more likely to contemplate quitting. Um, now it's not a dramatic uh, uh, likelihood of improvement, but it just really goes to mention how, um, uh, um, how images can, can really evoke this movement, evoke an action, evoke a behavior change. Uh, this is an art comment from an artist um, that is a, a, a schoolmate of mine in, in grade school. Um, we're still friends, uh, keeping in touch. So um, when, when she says, when we create, we activate that part of our brain that enables us to lose time, defy conventions, see things differently, and creatively problem solve. It sounds a lot like mindfulness in those words. Actively creating, forget about the clock and get lost in the process. 
or the colors or the message I wanna to bring to the world. I lose myself in something I love like a bluebird or a tree which helps me forget about the number of coronavirus cases climbing or whether I wipe down my shoes. I can be somewhere less stressful when I create and that helps me physically and mentally. My heart rate slows, my focus intensifies. So you can see here, you know, the, the effect of their, you know, her body actually feeling the, 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 the experience. My focus intensifies. It's a great deal de-stressing endeavor as much as it is a means of communication. And as much when I need to work through feeling or situation, one thing that I got from this person's speaker off. How do I do this? Okay, got it. Inasmuch when I need to work through a feeling or a situation by working in my right brain, I can process feelings on canvas rather than keep them bottled up similar to dreaming. I can splash and wash, blot, spray, and use color to get my feelings out that way. Making art is one of the few things I can do where I can come out at the end of the endeavor with a finished product to bring to the world that can hopefully help them in some way as much as it helped me in the process. So that, um, so that's a, a, a message that was shared by a, a friend of mine. And this is her, one of her art projects. Okay, let me just find out what's going on here. Okay, great. Uh, mindful movement. Now we'll talk about move, movement. So we know about yoga. Yoga is putting yourself in positions and breathing deeply. Much of yoga is about inspiration and expiration it, as much as it is about um, stretching. Um, so, so with the inspiration, you often um, are getting ready the intention. And then when you expire, you're making that stretch a little further. And so you're stretching those muscles, the tendons, the nerves are sensing that, and they're creating a stimulation to the brain, but you're also stimulating your brain, brain to relax, you're, re you're causing your brain to relax through your breathing. So it's sort of a multi-sensory way of, of channeling uh, uh, ways to relax yourself. Tai Chi is similar in that way. It's a movement that is a structure and that structure is experienced as you go through it. Um, you know, every time you do that structure, you have a different experience. So it's sort of like seeing a river and stepping in the river, you know, the river is moving in that experience, you're feeling that, you're not stepping, in, it, it may be the same river every time you step into it, but you're stepping into a different river, that kind of idea. And maybe that's a, a lesson to us about mindfulness is it's not, it doesn't require this kind of massive um, out of the box thinking. It can be very structured, rhythmic, you know, patterns that call up our minds to, you know, be in the moment. It reminds me of this, um, this message of, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this, the myth of Sisyphus. That's where uh, it's a Greek uh, uh, story, uh, uh, Greek mythology story, where um, this person is sort of con condemned to roll up a stone to the top of the cliff, and then all of their work gets just washed away when it, ha it comes back down, and then they have to start all over again. In that task, we have our experience. We, it captures our experience for that moment. So whatever that may be, you know, think of our day-to-day -day that way hopefully not completely burdensome as, as Sisyphus. Walking, jogging, and other exercises are, are also mindful in that way, and martial arts as well. Regular exercise is protective for the brain. It may actually reduce cognitive impairment. Um, probably more, you know, they have all these different puzzles and things that people can go through to reduce uh, cognitive impairment probably the best thing that they can do is physical exercise. Think about it. We're getting our, we're patterning, we're getting our bloodstream, uh, you know, filtering through, we're, we're pumping our heart in a healthy manner. Um, 20 to 30 minutes of exercise sustained is, is useful. Um, exercise just reduces the inflammatory status of the brain. It, um, and you can imagine probably why it's occurring. It's probably from, from the circulation effect uh, and, uh, and kind of removal effect. Um, exercise restores the immune status of the brain. Um, this was a study in 2015. 
they did um, fMRIs uh, after exercise, which showed improved uh, cortical connectivity. And some of the cr chronic inflammatory markers were down with increased, um, with increased exercise. We know that those chronic inf inflammatory markers are associated with cognitive dysfunction later on. Movement and the brain. Um, that's a little bit too complicated to mention here. So, um, and then finally meditation. Um, there was a study looking at meditative training with relaxation training um, and that FN, uh, functional MRI studies of 35 found connectivity of these various areas of the brain um, increase with meditation training, but not relaxation training. And then also inflammatory markers were decreased after four month follow-up in the meditation group. So what I'm saying here is um, I don't think you need to, you know, book a, book a course in uh, transcendental meditation, but, you know, there is something to say about meditation rather than, you know, just taking a few minutes to relax. I think we can all, um, you know, just, and, and, and the interesting thing about meditation is it is that very, that very cadence of, of experiencing our breath, experiencing that moment. As you experience that moment, things will kind of jump into your brain. Those are the past or future um, things that your prefrontal cortex is dumping out. But as we're experiencing that, we recenter. And it's really more on that kind of thinking about not thinking, you know, and sort of being in that moment. And that's why it's, it's sort of that paradox of mindfulness is in a way letting go of all those thoughts. Uh, this is a, a final slide, and I, I, I want to invite you to think about where you where you can be. This is this, who do I want to be during COVID-19? And you've got this fear zone, which we talked about, that kind of fight or flight response, where I get mad easily. I forward all messages I receive. I complain frequently. I spread emotions related to fear and anger. I grab food, toilet paper, medica medications that I don't need. Yeah. I, I, it still baffles me, and I, I could imagine a PhD psychology student might want to do a, you know, a this dissertation, a doctoral thesis on why, you know, why the toilet paper ran out so quickly. Uh, but, but you know, it, it, it kind of goes into this idea of fear and and sort of protecting self. Um, and then we go into this learning phase, learning zone, sort of this, you know, developing, you know, I showed you the sweet spot where we're away from fear, we're away from fight or flight, and here we are, this growing area. So I start to give up what I can't control. I stop compuls compulsively consuming what hurts me from food to news. I identify my emotions. So, you know, when you feel angry when something is said to you, by just saying simply in your mind, I'm feeling angry about this. And I need to understand why it helps you to start figuring out and it slows down that quick reflex to jump on someone, to call them names, to fight, what have you, to, or, to, or to degrade yourself, right? Some people, when, you know, if we're, it's sort of that uh, freeze um, response, you know, we don't want to hurt anyone. We could never hurt anyone. So let me hurt myself by not, by not, not setting my boundaries, by not, uh, explain a person what, what my needs are. I become aware of the situation and think how to act. I evaluate information before spreading something false. I recognize that we are trying to do our best. And then there's the growth zone. And that growth zone, oops, is, um, is helping others, you know, to see, to see things, to see the truth. I make my talents available to those who need, need them. I live in the present and focus on the future. You know, that's an interesting uh, dichotomy too, living in the present. You know, when you take a step, one step right now in the present, you're taking a step to, towards your future. And so you can, yes, you can, we can, um, if we bring our minds to the future all the time, we do miss what's going on in the present. But if we think of what, how our present moment by moment can shape us to our future self, then we are living in the present, but we, we're focusing on some goals. I'm empathetic with myself and with others. I thank and appreciate others. I keep a happy emotional state and spread hope. So it's sort of another pandemic of hope, hopefully. 
I keep a happy emotional state and spread hope. I look for a way to adapt to new changes and I practice quietude, patience and relationships and creativity. So just as a summary during the COVID-19 and beyond, you know, to be on your side, to realize that your initial instincts are reflexes, that behavior um, often in a way sort of is like a, sort of like that wrecking ball you know, it just, it just gets rid of things to protect yourself. But what it doesn't do, unfortunately, is it doesn't keep you in the context of working with other people, of working towards a positive goal. It basically is that, that original shelled self, that, that infant reflex of crying because you don't have a need met. And that happens to everyone. You know, we, I could be, I'm in my 40s. I, I could be in my 50s and I can still have those signals. I could be in my 70s, you know, like uh, some of the leaders are, and they can still be in those signals too. Neurons that fire together, wire together. Discover the wonderful role that was there all along. You know, and it's, uh, it's understanding bias and it's understanding um, that you can literally reshape your view. Exercise, meditation, and hobbies are likely to aid in the development of brain growth, and small positive actions add up over time. So thank you so much. Um, my information is available on my uh, blog or health information set, site called Your Health Forum by DrSereno.org. And um, my website is uh, www.yourhealthforum.net. And I'll be posting this um, in case um, you wanted to review this again. Are, are there any questions? I have a question, Chris. Yes. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for such an amazing, brilliant, uh, helpful presentation. Oh, you're very welcome. Really? Wow. I, I just uh, have, I wonder if you've ever come upon any studies that link changes in atmospheric pressure to the inner ear and thereby increasing people's tolerance for stress. And Stanford did a study a long time ago correlating the whole year of police reports to meteorological changes at the San Francisco airport. And they found a direct correlation to an increase in violent crimes, suicides, things like that, wow. to changes in atmospheric pressure. Well, that's interesting. I mean, um, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to, I can't link it up completely, but I, I do wonder, you know, I, I, I can only put it as a, a personal note. I know that if I ever were to get um, like a eustachian tube dysfunction going up flying, for instance, I know how distracting that is for, and I don't know if those atmospheric pressures would induce that to the middle ear. I imagine if, I imagine they could, but I know that sometimes that distraction leads to a problem with processing and, and your emotional state. So sometimes it, I could imagine, especially hearing loss, we can see this in, in, normal, in normal hearing, presbycusis, which is basically you know, an aging middle ear uh, um, where the, the, you know, the, the stapes and the hammer, they don't, they're not working as, as well. They're not triggering a sensory input, we know that something as simple as hearing loss can be associated with changes in the brain, including atrophy in the brain in those in, in where the what part of the brain focuses on hearing processing. And we know that if you were to hear something and not hear it completely, that it would affect your ability to remember that. And so I would say that those changes in, in atmospheric pressure, it, I, you know, it, it originally, it just like on surface, it sounds like, you know, they're, they're apples and oranges. They don't relate to how it could affect processing, but if it potentially affects one's ability to acquire their sense and process their sense of hearing, then yeah, it could potentially be a factor. So I can't completely link those two things together, but I wonder, if it has anything to do with that in some of those cases. Well, the link seems to be uh, that uh, your inner ear is, gives you kind of like a cruise control automatic pilot for spatial orientation. 
Definitely. And when that gets interfered with, then the other more conscious parts of your brain have to start taking over that role, at which point people find themselves already kind of overloaded with brain activity. And so when somebody says something wrong to them, they, they get inordinately angry at, at, at that point. It could be. I mean, I, I mean, we know that with certain um, um, conditions, including Alzheimer's, dementia, and Parkinsonism, that there is some atrophy in the body's, um, uh, the brain's visuospatial center, the hippocampus, hippocampus. And so there is, you know, there, there could be a link to some of these processing uh, de defects and, um, and, and how our hippocampus reacts to, to triggers. You know, there's conditions such as, um, you know, uh, vertigo, benign positional vertigo. There's um, kind of this autoimmune um, labyrinthitis. And these conditions can be super taxing on the brain yeah. and obviously trigger stressors that can lead to depression. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. Okay, what am I going to do? When I, I hear someone. I hear someone in the background, and we we got to put you on pause. Okay. Are there any other questions? Yes. Yes. Um. Uh, I I have been by stroke, so I talk um, difficult, but sure. Um. um uh, I meditate every day well, for wonderful. twenty or twenty-five minutes. Um, and, um, uh, my teachers, um, often start by saying, um, uh, when you start the day, someone in, uh, uh, when someone 35 or 25 starts a day, they layer one thing on another and another and another um, so that they are always doing five things at once. And my teachers say that's terrible and uh, see meditation as yeah. A focus on one thing. Yes. Yeah, and, that's true. Um, so uh, I focus on during doing the dishes at night, and I focus in walking from one room to the other, um, and don't think about these other things uh, mm -hmm. while I'm doing it. Well, you're so being mindful. You, yeah, you don't need to do special things mm -hmm. in order to meditate or think of one thing. It's very true. And I think, Lee, it's a good point um, about the fact that I think sometimes we think of our time as being so precious that we yes. want to just kind of let's do several things at one time. But essentially what happens is you know, our brain is having to process all of those things. And so when you're doing one activity and we shift to another, our brain has to stop and has to recalibrate and it can't do two or three things at one time. Mm -hmm. It really, um, you know, it's like the idea of, well, what about texting and driving? Is that a good idea? No, yes. it's not a good idea um, because essentially your brain has to stop focusing in front of the road for that two seconds to look down and um, that could be at very high speeds. That could be a, a, a life-changing uh, decision. So yeah, so I think the idea mindfulness in a sense is, you know, as much as it has a little bit of a mystique to it is really just living your life in the now towards goals. Yes. And, um, you, know, you know, as opposed to just kind of letting the river flow and take you where the current takes you, you're, you're sort of using your utter you know, the utter to affect, uh, the, the rudder rather, not utter, the <laughs> rudder to affect the, the shifting. And, and, uh, and, that's, and that's the idea of mindfulness. Yeah. Um, great, well, thank you so much for joining me today. And we'll have uh, this posted. If you can share this to your friends to review, um, we have both mindfulness talks, the more kind of 
you know, nitty gritty uh, mind and, and neuro nervous system part. And then we've got this other part, which um, I think um, hopefully will have, uh, you know, covered a lot of these issues. And if not, uh, uh, stimulated you to, to search further uh, for some of these answers.